Reaction to the New Orleans Saints, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Bucks 51, Saints 27, yuck. Spencer Rattler shows promise and Dennis Allen's days numbered as head coach. This is Off the Bench with T-Bob in a very nice shirt. Look at that, very nice shirt there. And then Jacob Hester and I, of course, in the face of the franchise. Let's go ahead and listen, react, talk about this. And do what only I can do. Uh, the New Orleans Saints fall to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 51 to 27. Yep. Fourth straight loss for the black and gold. Uh, you know, I was painting this as the final stand of the Dennis Allen era. I have seen nothing to take me off of that. It's shifted. <laughs> like, it's, it is, it's worse. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Like, it has gone so far in the other direction where I'm with T-Bob where it's like, okay, coming into this game, season's on the line, put up or shut up. You know, defense has to step up. Spencer Rattler's first game, let the rest of the team kind of lift him up. And it went so far in the other direction. Not only did we not win the game, not only did we not pick up Spencer Rattler, not only did the defense not stand up, it was the worst defensive performance of the season, possibly in the last like ten years. Uh, like, it's not even. It's so far, so far in the other direction. You know, it's like, what do you even say? What do you even say after a performance like that? How do you even quantify, or how do you even like, really kind of like, how, how do you even like what we just saw? What are you supposed to say? Um. We told you going into the game, basically an impossible situation for Spencer Rattler. Uh, and exactly, like exactly, it the impossible situation got even more impossible off the jump. Like, okay, bad situation, horrible situation, no doubt about it. Uh, two plays in, Chris Olave's out for the game. Like, at that point, I mean, at you're stacking up impossibilities on top of impossibilities on top of impossibilities. And the offense wasn't even the problem. Were we the 05 Broncos? No. But then you look at the defense, which is supposed to be the strength of the team, and the defense gives up 600 yards and has the worst performance maybe ever. Like, it's it's an absolute factory of sadness right now. It is a factory of sadness as a Saints fan. After the Eagles game, oh man, it can't get worse than this. After the Falcons game, man, can't get worse than this. After the Chiefs game, man, can't get worse than this. And they just keep getting worse. It just keeps getting worse in a different way. Like It is a shocking time to be a Saints fan right now something that we didn't talk about a ton coming into the game, but definitely looked like it was true come Sunday was like, that's also a Tampa team that with the hurricane, everything sort of playing for something a bit deeper already with a lot of confidence, right? Already uh, the belief of, Oh, we are the defending divisional champions and we believe in our quarterback and the vibes are high right now, but then also our city, which we like anytime a team's going well, the relationship that forms between the city and the team is special. And Tampa's going through that right now. And so when the city's going through something, there is that extra reserve of wanting to really put on for the city. And it was all on display um, yesterday as, I mean, I turned it on after church and it's what, 17 nothing already. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Like, well, they came back from that. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But then 51. Like we're okay. Like, like leading up to the game, you know, I'm getting hyped up. I'm thinking of all the different possibilities of what we could see. Kickoff happen. You know, like you're going through the pregame stuff. You're fired up. I'm fired up. Everyone around me's fired up. But then immediately it's extinguished because it's 17 nothing. Chris Olave's out. 17 nothing. You're sitting there like, what the hell just happened? And then equally as fast, you're up. Like equally as fast, you're as fast. It's like, well, holy shit, we're up. It's 27 to 24. Like. It's halftime. Oh my God. If we just kind of hold on to this thing, you know, like the swings of emotion is just insane. And then you're sat there and forced to watch. I felt like I was watching like Hostel or something. I felt like I was watching some kind of horror film. Like you're sit there and you're forced to watch the Buccaneers rattle off 27 unanswered points in the second half as your team just can't do anything. And it's like, man, I'm, I'm 
there isn't enough Crown Royal in the stadium to, to, to sit here and watch Sean Tucker run for 140 yards in the game. And 27. Um, what do you think? I mean, do we start with Rattler? Where do we start here? Uh, I, I think you start with the defense. To be honest, I mean, that was yeah. that's supposed to be the calling card of your head coach. That's supposed to be the saving grace, the one thing about your head coach. And when you look at the numbers, T-Bob, it's just a bad unit, and it shouldn't be. Like, you've yeah. got too yes. many Agreed. good players yes. on that side of the football, and it's completely lost right now. You are right now. Is it? You think it's complete? You don't think T-Bob, this is the- being one bad game? Brother, what? I'm getting pissed off. One bad game, my boy. We gave up my guy. We gave up seven yards of play to the Eagles. We gave up seven yards of play to the Falcons. We gave up six plus yards of play to the Chiefs. We lost to the Chiefs in, by uh, 20 minutes in time of possession because we couldn't get off the field. We gave up whatever it was 30 first downs to the Buccaneers. We haven't had a good performance from the defense since week two, since week one and week two. The defense has been bad for four consecutive weeks. I said this after the Eagles game. I said it after the Falcons game. I said it after the Chiefs game. Well, I didn't have to say it after the Chiefs game, but when you look at just like, oh, well, the Falcons didn't score an offensive touchdown. Oh, well, the Eagles didn't have any points until the fourth quarter. That's why I always harp that you have to look at the context. When you are... When you're not allowing any points, but the team is averaging seven yards per play, that is not a good performance. Like, that is not a good defensive performance. Now, the part that confuses me or confounds me is that, like Jacob said, we have way too many good individual pieces who are simultaneously playing pretty well. Like, Carl Granderson is having a decent year, especially when you look at, like, pressure rate and things. Chase Young, high pressure rate. Not sacks, but high pressure rate. So you got your two edge rushers having a very high pressure rate season so far. That seems like a good thing. Marshawn Lattimore right now is playing fantastic, right? One of his best stretches of his career. Then all of a sudden you're looking at, you can even say Elante Taylor has been good. Paulson Adiba has been okay besides the, besides the, uh, the penalties. The, but somehow when you put all that together, it's like, well, this seems like you put all these pieces together, it'd be a good defensive unit. Then you put all this together and you're like, oh, well, actually, they're giving up the most yards and they're giving up the most yards per game in, an NFL, in the NFL right now. Which again, to T-Bob's point of T-Bob saying like, is it just one bad game? My brother in Christ, not one bad game isn't the reason that we're giving up the most yards per game in the NFL. T-Bob, you realize they're last in the NFL. In what? In yards given up per game. Uh. Dead last in 32nd. So, no, it's not in, one game. What are game. they in scoring, though? Because I haven't, I haven't had a problem with any defensive performance, save for yesterday. I've had a problem with... De- that is nuts. I mean, no, no, look. That is absolutely insane. Like, that is... That's crazy. That is... What that is is evidence of looking at... Like, there's two different types of people that watch the game. You have super results-based people who look at win-loss, and I'm not saying that one way is better than the other. I'm just explaining that this is how you can look at games. You can look at win-loss and like the super high-level result. Did you score a touchdown? You know, was there a turnover? Like like numbers like that. Or you can look. Or there's other people who look at kind of this like blended context thing. I'll give you an example. Pop quiz. Let's say. Your team is on defense. Let's pretend the Saints are on defense. Let's pretend the Buccaneers are on the one-yard line, their own one. So they have 99 yards to go. And let's say the Buccaneers drive 99 yards. And let's say on the other one now, the Buccaneers hand it off. They fumble out of the back of the end zone. Saints get the ball because of a touchback. Is that a good defensive possession? I would argue no, because you just gave up 99 yards, and on the one, a fluke thing happens where the running back just fumbles. You could argue, oh, we forced the fumble. It is what it is, right? You didn't even recover the fumble. It went out of the back of the end zone. 
on the flip side, you could look at that and say, yes, it's a positive, it is a positive possession because we did not allow points and we forced a turnover. Okay. Each of those arguments has merit, but you can see where that's one situation where just that right there is very divided. Then you look at the box score, that goes down as a zero, a zero for the Bucks, right? But it also goes to 99 yards to the total and probably eight yards of play. So that is how you get these situations where two different people watching the same game can view the same thing happening in two very different ways. The Eagles game and the Falcons game were exactly what I just described, where the Saints are giving up a ton of plays. They're giving up a ton of first downs. They're giving up a ton of yardage. But in high leverage situations, fourth and one, goal line, things like that, they're either getting turnovers or getting stops. So it's like this good on one side, bad on the other side. But when you go long stretches of time, like four games, where you're giving up a ton of yards, a ton of time of possession, a ton of first downs, a ton of rushing, this happens. This happens right here. Defensive moments. I mean, like I think they're, the I think they're 24th have have in scoring defense. Oh, wow. I find and that dead last in yards. So I find that to be a bit shocking, the, actually. That, the if that's the calling card. The franchise cards. record for total yards yesterday, 594. The Bucks had 594 yards. No, no, I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not defeating yesterday's performance. I'm saying I'm shocked to hear that because I thought the defense has actually been really good all year. Besides, that's crazy, crazy. But yeah, I guess not. And, and look, well, then it's absolutely time for Dennis Allen to go. I mean, what do? We- but you see what I'm saying? Like that. That's why it's so important to look at the context of what's happening. That's why it's imperative to look at that. Because otherwise, you do get in a situation where you're like, oh, wow, we're, the defense has been good. Because you remember that there was no points going into the fourth for the Eagles. You remember the Falcons didn't score any offensive touchdowns. But like Jacob just said, you have one bad performance points-wise, like with the touchdowns and all this stuff. All of a sudden, you're 24th in points allowed and 32nd in yards allowed. So, I mean, it's crazy times. What are you talking about? Supposed to be your side of the ball, right? And, and you have been great there. It's supposed to be where you hang your hat on. So and yeah. you're you're last by five full yards. So yeah. it's it's not really close. And and the Jags are the team that's thirty first. And the Jags are absolutely a trash can. And they're horrid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they gave up a ton of yards yesterday to the Bears. So yeah, the Panthers are four spots better than you. Um. Nothing is more volatile than a. Uh, than a coordinator defensive backs are really volatile coordinators are really volatile as far as like they can be really good one year and then the next year not be not very good the reason that i think defensive backs are is because they get judged on a play-by-play basis defensive backs are the only position where on one play they can be the greatest player of all time second play they can get burned and look absolutely ridiculous right so we see, like, Stephon Gilmore, one defensive player of the year, a year later or two years later, he was cut or traded for, like, a six. Like, the, it, the volatility of that position is very high. Coordinators are the exact same. Depending on the scheme, depending on the roster, depending on the game script, depending on the situational moments, depending on the turnovers, which can be fluky, a defense can look really, really good, which means a defensive coordinator can look really, really good. That same coordinator a year later can get fired or look terrible. One example is uh, Sweet Lou in Cincinnati. Last year, Lou Anarumo is considered one of the best defensive coordinators in the NFL. This year, he's considered getting fired because of how bad the Bengals' defense has been. 2012, the New Orleans Saints set a record, NFL record, for the most yards per game given up in a season. The most yards given up in a season. Who was that defensive coordinator? Steve Spagnola. A couple years later, what, four years later, he's with the Chiefs. He's probably the best defensive coordinator in the NFL right now. So it's like just because a coordinator is good doesn't mean they're going to be good forever. Just because they're bad doesn't mean they're going to be bad forever. Coordinator is very volatile. Dennis Allen is right now in that volatility. He's been a really, really, really good defensive coordinator for the last, let's just say, five years. Okay? Right now, he's not. It is what it is. Things change. Things get fluid. You got to be able to pivot when you have a 
when you have like a prior, we call them prior. A prior is like a preconceived idea. It's how we do like power rankings and stuff. Dennis Allen was the number one ranked defensive play caller last year. Right now, 32nd in yards per game, 24th in points allowed. The prior no longer exists. Okay. It happens. It happens to coordinators. It happens to defenses. It happens like the Browns. The Browns had a really good defense last year. I would assume they finished probably top five in defense last year. The Browns are asshole this year. The Browns are terrible. That no longer can you sit there and be like, hey, the Browns have a great defense. The Saints are now in that world where no longer can you sit here and say this is a good defensive unit or the Saints are, you know, they had they had they're held up by their defense, strong defense, whatever. Nope. Not the case. You cannot be 32nd in yards allowed per game. You cannot be 24th in points allowed per game and sit there and call yourself a good defense or a good defensive coordinator. Not how it works. So, see you later, as far as I'm concerned. Get Dennis Allen out of here. What, what's he doing here? He's not doing any, anything for the culture. He's not doing anything for the locker room or the man management. He's not doing anything for the, uh, the situational like game planning or coaching. And he's not doing anything for the defense. So I'm having a really difficult time figuring out why he's in the building. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, you know, this is the end. It's got to be. Yeah, it is, 100%. Friends, the end. You it, were asking about, like, what they did before yesterday. So they gave up 594 yesterday. Give up 460 to the Chiefs on Monday night. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, you know. Keep going. Keep yeah, going. I get, I get, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I am I haven't, I didn't really take the Chiefs game into account um, either. That Brother, the Chiefs was the best out of the four. I'm getting hot under the collar. The Chiefs was the best defensive performance out of those four. Because I think the Chiefs game, they held Kareem Hump to like 3.8 yards of carry or something. The Eagles game was way worse. The Eagles game was the worst of the bunch. Well, besides the Bucks game. The Bucs game was the worst. Eagles game was the second worst. The Falcons game was the third worst. The Chiefs game was the fourth worst. So that that goes to show the problem is considering the Falcons and the Eagles games good defensive performances. That was definitely not great. But I mean, every I don't know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not arguing it. I thought they were better um, outside of yesterday. I think we just. I'm shocked because I'm they were like not. you. Like you, you assume. A lot of things, because I do too. I mean, with the well, defense. Well, they won the first but, two games with the defense looking really good. And then. With offenses having to get outside of what they typically do because yeah. you scored so many but points. But then even as the well. Eagles game, right? And then against Atlanta, you don't get. See? I'm, this is the danger of the points. This is the danger of viewing just points. Give up an offensive touchdown. Like, there, there was a lot of good defense there until the last two weeks. The second quarter yesterday, they were awesome. The defense was great. Huh. I mean, they got you back into the game. But outside of that. Let me show you. Let me show you what I'm talking about. All right, look at these two games. Just look at the, just look at the numbers. Don't look at the score. Look at these two. Yards per play, 6.9. Yards per rush, 6.9. Uh, first down's 20. Yards, 460. And look at this game. All right. Uh, eight point two yards per play, seven point nine yards per rush. Like these are pretty similar. These are pretty similar. The main difference is that the, obviously the yards, but it's also they also you got to tackle. I mean, it's only five more plays, but uh, the yards and the first downs are like the big differences. But the the huge difference is the number, right? Like these performances aren't that far apart as far as like what you're allowing. You're allowing seven yards of play, seven yards of rush. Here you're you're giving up eight and eight. So you got seven and seven, eight and eight. The yards, you're giving up 100, 130 more yards, which is, you know, that's that's something. But when you look at the number, these two don't look like that they're you know 36 points off. Right? Like this box score of the Eagles and this this box score of the Bucks. The Bucks is obviously a worse defensive performance. You're giving up eight and eight versus seven and seven, and you're giving up five ninety four versus four sixty. But you wouldn't look at these two and say this one is a thirty six point difference in defensive performance, right? That's the difference. So, like to point at the Eagles game and to point at this as a good perform, good defensive performance. Ugh. 
Ugh. Um, what what do we think about Spencer Rattler? Again, an impossible situation no, for him. Um, any hope there going forward? Yeah. Yes. I, I think as far as Spencer, you saw enough to say, okay, we're going to keep playing him. He's not Ian Book. He's not lost out there. I thought Spencer Rattler's first game was probably pretty similar to Caleb Williams' first game, which was probably pretty similar to Jaden Daniels' first game. Like Daniels was bad his first couple of weeks. Caleb Williams was bad his first couple of weeks. I thought Rattler was decent, especially given the given the situation. You know, especially considering that Caleb Williams' first couple of weeks, he's got DeAndre Swift and and DJ Moore and Keenan Allen and Jaden Daniels' his first couple of weeks, he's got. Um, you know, some some competent players and Terry McLaurin and, and some of the backs that they have. The fact that Spencer Rattler's first week, you outfit him with three new offensive linemen and Bub Means, Mason Tipton, Rashid Shaheed. Like, I thought Rattler was pretty good. I'd keep playing him. Uh, yeah, I th- I, if, he, if he gets a little bit better, as you would hope rookies do as the year goes on, I think he's going to be above serviceable. I mean, I think there's hope going forward, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what did you see that gives you that? I think his- I, th- I thought he had a lot of. I, mean, I think his arm talent is there. I think yeah, he underthrew the first the interception, not by much, but he underthrew it. Uh, I thought he made some really good throws in some really tough spots, like a couple like third and eight, third and nines. He stood up in the pocket, would make throws in the middle of the field, uh, hit Jawan Johnson on a couple of those. I liked what I saw there. That's not usually a throw you're seeing a rookie make. Like usually a rookie. You know, like that's like the most dangerous throw. It's like those, you know, middle of the field. You got to really see what's going on there. I think I think he showed some arm talent there. Um, mobility, obviously, I like him scrambling around a little bit. Per usual, held onto the ball a little bit too long in some spots, took some sacks, but happens happens to happens to vets. Uh, certainly happens to rookies too. So I think there was a little bit there. There was a little. There was good mixed with bad, but. That's kind of what you're expecting with a rookie. So I, I thought everything was fine. His uh, ability to create on the move is always something that we've talked about. Um, if you can cut down on, I, I'd say, 10% of some of the decisions with that, though, that's where you're going to, you're, you're hoping that comes. Yeah, right. The decision part is what the real development. Like he missed Hooker on uh, in the red zone. He had a couple of plays where, you know, he's either hold, he's either waiting. For the guy to get open a step too long, um, yeah, the decision stuff is where I think you saw the most of his like rookiness. That either he's not trusting the read immediately, or he's double checking himself and holding it for a second too long, or completely missing the read or whatever. But you know, like I said, that kind of is what it is with time. But I, I do think there's some throws in there that you saw that his arm talent alone can make those throws where you yeah. don't have another quarterback on your roster that has the same arm talent. Yeah. Um, I thought they did a really nice job of getting him on the move early because I think that's where he's really comfortable. And, yeah. you know, the Bucks didn't really have an answer for it early. Now they did adjust. I was a little confused of why Kubiak didn't do more of that. Like, he – the most dangerous we were is whenever Rattler was doing like play action rollouts. And when we were kind of moving the pocket around and letting Rattler kind of have that, you know, the, the play action rollout, the one read and then make the thrower go. And if I would have been Kubiak, I would just kind of spam that. I would just spam that until they stopped it. And that would have been about it. Like I thought at times Kubiak got way too, I'll say pass happy. He got way too committed to like Rattler just in the pocket, which I would have not done at all. Like, why do that? You know, like we've seen, I've seen Sean McVay where if that play action rollout is working, I've seen Sean McVay run that like 17, 18, 19 straight times where he's just going to do it until it works. He's not, or until it gets stopped. He's not going to all of a sudden say, you know what? The play action rollout is kind of working. Moving the pocket's kind of working. How about we just, how about we just let Spencer kind of let it rip from back there for a little bit? And that's what that's when three and outs happen. Three and outs happen when all of a sudden it's working, it's working, it's working, and then you go first down shotgun pass, second down shotgun pass, third down shotgun pass, and then you're sitting here like, well, wish I had that one back. Us to it, but there was enough there for I, I think you to as an offensive staff look at what it was against the Bucks, create an even better game plan 
moving forward because like there's a skill set there, T, that you you can tell like there's some there's some first round stuff in there. That's why yeah, like three years sure. ago we were yes. talking about him being a surefire first round quarterback. You yeah. can see that now it's on this coaching staff to come up with a game plan to put this offense in the best situation possible. Look, the offense wasn't the, the issue yesterday. No, it was not. I would say Spencer was as good, if not better, than your combination of Bo Nix, Caleb Williams, Jay and Daniels in their first start. Hey, for me, I mean, you did some things offensively with, I mean, guys off the street yeah. playing in front of you. I mean, a yeah. center that was on his couch about 10 days ago. You got Bub Means out there as your number two receiver. like So there wasn't a lot for Spencer Rattler to work with, and I thought there was enough there to yeah. now move forward with an, an even better game plan. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we'll see. Season does feel a bit lost right now. We can talk about that maybe next. Like, how do you, how do you approach the rest of the season if you are the New Orleans Saints? Well, how? I mean... That's a different video for a different day, but you got to – the the uniqueness of the schedule makes that a difficult question to answer right now because if we beat Denver, then you kind of reassess and say, okay, well, if we can get healthy, you know, at that point you're three and four. It certainly isn't lost. I mean, you're three and four – you know, you just beat Denver. Okay, now you can write things like, all right, maybe we can battle for a 10-win season, battle for a wild card. You know, but if you lose that game and you're two and five, and you just dropped home games to the Broncos and the Bucks, then the season probably is officially lost. And if the season is officially lost, then you have to really wonder, like, well, why are we playing Derek Carr? Why why don't we just play Spencer Rattler? And if you're playing Spencer Rattler, then you probably have already fired Dennis Allen. And if you, you know, like then all of a sudden the dominoes start happening. You start your the first conversation you have is your salary cap. And all right, well we're we're we are shifting into a rebuild. Okay, well then how do we get out of Carr's contract? How do we get out of Demario's contract? How do we get out of Cam's contract? How do we get out of um, Tyran's contract? And and you know who who are we keeping? Who are we moving? You know then you're moving Alvin Kamara. You're moving Demario Davis. You're moving. Cam Jordan, you're moving Tyron Matthew, you're moving Paulson Adebo, you're moving Derek Carr, and that's no that's to no fault of their own. Like that's to no fault of Tyran or Demario or Cam or Alvin or Derek. But when you are shifting into a rebuild, you don't keep thirty plus year old guys who are costing you a ton of money. It just doesn't doesn't work like that. So then you do shift into a rebuild, and you go find a coach that's going to be at the helm of that rebuild. And then you decide, is Spencer Rattler your guy? Because then you're probably going to have a top 10 draft pick. I would think the Saints are going to use that top 10 draft pick on someone like uh, like Will Campbell out of LSU or a, a top lineman. And then, all of a, then you go from there. Because if you're going to keep Spencer Rattler, you're not going to use that draft pick on a quarterback, obviously. But And then it's kind of hard to imagine using it on a quarterback when you need so much else. So... That's kind of the domino effect I see. But see, but like I said, we'll talk about that in a different video. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know in the comments below. I'll see you in the next video.